Resourceful Designer, Episode 95, Designing Under an NDA. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host, he prefers to sleep on his stomach, Mark DeCote. Welcome to the podcast. I'm glad you've joined me this week. I have what I think is an interesting topic. And let me tell you, I got this topic because of a little bit of an experience that I had earlier this week. I had a job that I was working on for a client. It was a web, uh, a web job. And there was part of the project that was a very monotonous task that had to be done. It was basically, I had to go in and change a whole pile of links just changing the URLs. And this is not something I would normally do. This is something I would normally farm out, have somebody else do it. But in this case, I had signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement with this client saying that I would not share any information about this website with anybody. So I couldn't farm this out unless it, it, I could have if I got another NDA signed, but it was just too much trouble. So anyways, I was stuck doing this work for a couple of hours on, on uh, Monday. And it got me thinking about NDAs. And I thought this would be a great topic for the podcast. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. And I hope you like it as well. Because an NDA is something that as designers, at some point in our career, we're going to have to sign them. I've had many, many over the years that I've had to sign. And they're really not that scary. It's not that big a deal. But if you don't know what they are going in, it might be something that you worry about. So that's the topic I chose today. But before we get to that topic... I want to talk to you about Storyblocks, the sponsor for this podcast. Now, Storyblocks is made up of three sites, videoblocks.com, audioblocks.com, and Storyblock Images at storyblocks.com, which was formerly graphicsdocs.com. But today I just want to talk about one of the sites, videoblocks.com. Do you know what a cinemagraph is? If not, it's when you have a what looks like a still image, but one part of the image or maybe two parts of the image are moving. For example, you have a photo of a young girl blowing bubbles and the girl is perfectly still, but you see bubbles coming out of the little whatever thing that she's holding in front of her mouth. And it's just the bubbles that are moving. Well, that is a cinemagraph. And they've become really popular with websites, especially for hero images on landing pages, because it catches a viewer's attention. Now, the way you create a cinemagraph is to start off with a video and you isolate one frame from that video and then you kind of mask out areas to allow it to move more. Now, this isn't a tutorial on cinemagraphs, but what I want to get at is in order to create a cinemagraph, you need to start with a video. And videos, if you've done searches for them, can get really expensive. Even a short clip, like a 10-second clip sometimes, can cost you hundreds of dollars depending on the sites you go to. Well, at videoblocks.com, you get access to over 150,000 videos, all part of your subscription. And you can download all of them if you wanted to, and you can use them because their content is royalty-free, and you can use it for commercial use, in your personal projects, whatever you want. So if you are in need of videos for your next project, Videoblocks is the perfect site for you. And as a special deal, just for resourceful designer listeners, Storyblocks is offering an amazing offer. Normally, video blocks would cost you $149 per year. But if you sign up by visiting storyblocks.com slash resourceful designer, you can get all three sites, video blocks, audio blocks, and Storyblocks images for the one price of $149 per year. Over 150,000 videos and over 100,000 audio clips. So sign up for this amazing offer by visiting storyblocks.com. That's S-T-O-R-Y-B-L-O-C-K-S dot com slash resourceful designer. You won't be disappointed. Now, as always, before I get to the main topic of a podcast, I like to share a resource of the week. And this week's resource is a little bit different. There was a conversation in the Facebook group just the other day. And if you're not part of the Facebook group, you can join by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash group. And you will be asked three questions. Simply answer those questions and I will allow you into the group. Now, recently, Sean posted a question on whether or not you should be sharing your home address with your clients if you work from home. 
And there was a lot of discussion and a lot of different opinions. Well, I want to share my opinion here on the podcast, and this is my resource of the week. And my resource is a P.O. box. It is such an easy compromise or solution to the problem of whether or not you should share your home address with your clients. Now, if you're wondering, well, why wouldn't I? I work from home. Why wouldn't I share this? Well, there are a couple of reasons. For one, if you are married or you have kids or significant others or or whatever living with you, you might not want to share that information for their security. You don't want people just showing up at your house, maybe when you're not there, and it's just your kids at home or just your wife or your husband. For security purposes, you might not want people knowing where you live. The other reason is you might not be in your quote unquote forever home. Maybe you're renting an apartment somewhere. And if you start using that address as your business address, and then one day you decide to move, you're going to buy a house, you decide to upgrade to a different apartment, then you have to change your address absolutely everywhere. So those are just two reasons. Now there are many, many more, but getting a mailbox for your business is a very, very convenient thing to have. And it solves a lot of problems with some of the things I just mentioned. Your clients don't know where you live. You can move as much as you want and your address stays the same. Not to mention, if you go on holidays and your mail is piling up, it's an indication that you're not home. But if your mail for business is going to a separate P.O. box somewhere, then you got that extra added peace of mind. So check out your local post office or wherever. Sometimes there's shopping malls that have P.O. boxes. But my preference and the way I do it is I have a box at my local UPS store. And the reason I like the UPS store is because they don't call their boxes P.O. boxes. They call them suites. And what that means is if you have to have something shipped, you order something and in the specifications of the shipping, it says we do not deliver to P.O. boxes. They can deliver to a UPS store because it's not a P.O. box. It's a suite. And the thing is, is if it's something that requires a signature or requires somebody present just to accept it, the staff at the UPS store are there and can do that on your behalf. And plus, it just sounds kind of cool whenever I say that my address is such and such an address suite 338. It makes me sound a little bit more important. So that's my resource of the week. Just for security purposes and for peace of mind, if you are running a home-based business, I highly suggest you get a P.O. box or, in the case of the UPS store, a suite just somewhere else for your mail to be delivered to keep it separate from your home life. And I'm sure that there's some place near where you live that can accommodate you. And now, designing under an NDA. Now, first off, I have to state that I am not a lawyer. So anything I talk about here, you may want to discuss with a lawyer before moving forward or that but I just want to give you my opinion on NDAs. Now, what exactly is an NDA? If you're not familiar with it, NDA stands for non-disclosure agreement. Now, depending on who is writing them or where they're coming from, they could fall under different names as well. Non-disclosure agreement is probably the most popular one, or they can also be called a confidentiality agreement or a CA. They can be called a confidential disclosure agreement, a CDA, proprietary information agreement, a PIA, or simply a secrecy agreement, an essay. But for the purpose of this episode, I'm going to refer to the NDA. Now, according to Wikipedia, an NDA is a legal contract between at least two parties that outlines confidential material, knowledge, or information that the parties wish to share with one another for certain purposes, but wish to restrict access to or by third parties. It is a contract through which the parties agree not to disclose information covered by the agreement. An NDA creates a confidential relationship between the parties to protect any type of confidential and proprietary information or trade secrets. As such, an NDA protects non-public business information. And that's the definition on Wikipedia. But in other words, an NDA is part of a contract, or an NDA could be a contract in of itself that protects the giver of the information from having that information used to their detriment. Now, as a designer you may be asked to sign an NDA by your clients. They might not want to give you the information that you require for a project without you signing one. I've had to sign many, many NDAs over the years. I remember the very first time I was working at the print shop and I was working on a job, the client had developed a new type of quote-unquote shovel for removing old shingles from a roof. 
And he was in the process of having it patented, but the patent hadn't come through yet. So he requested that I was the designer assigned to the project. He had the print shop and he had myself sign an NDA saying that we would not take that information and do anything with it because he was afraid since the patent hadn't been issued yet that he can lose out if somebody else stole the idea. So I had to sign an NDA and I believe that was the very first time I ever signed one. But since then, through the print shop or since I've been on my own, there have been many times where I've had to sign one. Some of them I thought were fruitless, but the client requested it anyways. And sometimes there was very good reason to sign it. And in fact, there's been several projects I've worked on over the years where I think there should have been an NDA, but there wasn't. So when should you agree to sign an NDA? Now, as I said, there's many instances where it would be appropriate. But the main one is when one party, in this case your clients, need to share valuable information with another party, in this case you, but they want to ensure that you don't steal or use that information without their approval. Here, I'll give you some examples. Say you're asked to design something that'll be used to maybe present to a potential partner or investors or distributors. If you've ever watched one of those shows on TV like Shark Tank, well, these people come in to present to these investors, to the sharks, and they have some beautifully designed stuff. Well, some of them already have a company started, but some of them are just working on things. And these designs, they may have had the designer sign an NDA because they were still trying to get this business going. They were still trying to get investors. So they might get the designer to sign an NDA so that the designer doesn't take the idea or share the idea with anybody else and potentially hurt their chance of success. Another reason you may be asked to sign an NDA is maybe you're going to be working with something that includes financial information. If you're doing a, an annual report for a company and the report isn't due to be released until such and such a date, but you're working on it beforehand, you might have to sign an NDA just saying that you won't divulge any of that information until the, the release date of the report. Now, that doesn't just include financial information. It could be marketing information or any other sorts of sensitive information that could hurt your client if that information got out. Now, maybe you're asked to work on something that needs to be kept confidential until a certain time. Say one of your clients is a, I don't know, a musical, a band or a performer or whatever, and they are going to be doing a North American tour or a worldwide tour. And you're asked to design, I don't know, let's say the t-shirt. You're going to design the concert t-shirt for, uh, who knows, let's pick uh, Taylor Swift. So you are contracted, lucky you, by the way, you are contracted to design Taylor Swift's new tour concert. And if you know anything about tour concert t-shirts, the back of the t-shirt usually lists all the venues and dates that the concert or the tour took place on. Well, you are given that information, but maybe that information hasn't been released to the public yet. There's speculation that Taylor Swift will be launching on a North American tour, but she hasn't announced it. And we have no idea where the tour dates are going to be or where the what cities. And yet you have that information because you've been asked to design the T-shirt and, and get that or maybe it's posters or just the social media information that's going to go out. So you have that confidential information. And you have to sign an NDA saying that you won't divulge that information until Taylor Swift or her team releases it, at which point you are freed from the NDA. So that is a great example of when you might have to sign one. Now, another reason you might be asked to sign an NDA is if you will be given access to anything that is confidential or proprietary. For example, you have a website, you have a client that you're building a website and it's an e-commerce site and they have this special sales funnel in order to get people into their their mailing system and into their, their uh, well, the sales funnel in order to buy their product. Well, maybe this is something that they developed before you came on, or it's something that you are developing for them and they make you sign something because they don't want the information on how they get their sales, how they attract their, their clients to get out to the competition. So you might have to sign something in that uh, respect. The other reason you might need to sign something like this is you might have access to their client list. Say it, it, as they clients join or pay, they become a member. This might be a membership site. Well, if you're working on the back end of the website, you might have access to all their member list, including all the members' personal information. You have all their email addresses, maybe their phone numbers, maybe their addresses. Who knows what information they collect? 
Well, you might have access to that and they might ask you to sign an NDA, preventing you from using that information either to sell and to, to gain any benefit or for using that information yourself. Because what's stopping you from taking all those email addresses and creating a mailing list that you can maybe make a profit off by sending your own information out to them? So there are lots and I, there's many, many more scenarios that I'm not discussing here where you may be asked and you probably should be signing a non-disclosure agreement. Now, I just want to state that there are, in general, two types of non-disclosure agreements. There's a mutual and a non-mutual. And basically what it means is a mutual NDA goes both ways. It means that you agree not to share any secretive or personal or confidential information that is shared with you, and your client agrees to the same thing with any information that you share with them. Now, mutual agreements are more or less for mergers and partnerships and that sort of stuff. Most of the time, you will deal with a non-mutual or a one-way NDA, and that will be your client asking you to sign it so that you don't share any of the information that they give you. So just keep in mind that there are two. And if they do have a two-way, most of the time you can actually strike that out or, or go ahead and sign it. I mean, really, you're not giving them any information that would be confidential unless you're sharing stuff with them. But I can't see from a designer's perspective why you would have confidential information you're sharing with your clients. But I just wanted you to know that there are the two different varieties. There's the mutual and the non-mutual NDA. So I've talked about how or why you might have to sign and the two different types. But what exactly are the key elements that go into an NDA? If you've never seen one or, or never had to deal with one before, you might not know what goes in. And in truth, unlike a, a contract, an NDA, and sorry, I shouldn't say that, an NDA is a contract. And an NDA can actually be part of your contract. You can include that in your contract if you want. But an NDA doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, an NDA could just be a, a few paragraphs of text on a, maybe one or two sheets of paper, but an NDA does have to have some key elements to it. First of all, an NDA needs to identify all parties involved. And when I say all parties, that might not just be you and your client. Your client is giving you the information, but if you have a team or maybe you hire contractors or if you're brokering the printer sale, maybe you have to deal with the printers the NDA might encompass all of them, or you might have to pass on or get the contractors and the printers to sign their own NDA. So the NDA needs to identify who is involved. Now, in the case that I said earlier this week, I had an NDA that I had signed and the NDA set, didn't allow me to share that information with a third party. So that's why I couldn't farm out that tedious part of the job that I, I ended up working on. And it wasn't a big deal. I knew when I signed it that I'd have to do that. It was just one of those things that I said, eh, it's only going to take a couple of hours. I might as well do it. They were paying me enough money for it. So why not? But that was one that the parties involved were just the client and myself. Now, an NDA also needs to define what is deemed to be confidential because not everything that the client is going to tell you or give you may be considered confidential. Now, a lot of times a client will ask you to sign something that says everything they give you is included under the NDA. And it's up to you whether you want to sign that or if you want to go back to them and say, no, I refuse to sign something that says everything is included. I want you to clearly identify what I can and cannot divulge. For example, everything that they give you written might be considered confidential, but what if they're talking to you in person or on the phone? Is that information that they tell you also part of the confidentiality agreement? Now, if it is, you might want to include a clause or a statement in the NDA saying that any verbal information that is given should be followed up with a written, either an email or something written, handwritten, stating that that information that was given to you is part of the NDA and is considered confidential, just so you have something in writing. Because if they come back to you at some point and say, that information I told you was uh, confidential and you shouldn't have disclosed that, what's to stop you from saying, well, what information? You know, that's just stuff I knew or, or what? Anyways, uh, I mean, the, there can be a lot of he said, she said in, in this case. So always ask them to specifically write out what can and cannot be divulged or what you need to keep secret and specify 
that if anything is given verbally, then they should follow up with an email just stating that that conversation about this topic is confidential information and falls under the signed NDA. Now, the other thing that an NDA needs to have is what are your obligations as the signer or the receiving party of the information? Generally, what this encompasses is you are responsible to make sure that all the information that's given to you doesn't get out. If somebody gives you, um, I don't know, a sheet with their income report on it, well, don't leave that sheet of paper just lying on your desk when you go home or, or well, you, if you are working from home, don't leave it out there where visitors might be able to see it. Make sure that information gets put away. Same thing with email. If they email you information and for some reason you just leave that out or you forward that email onto somebody else with the information, you just, you just have to be careful on what you do and you are responsible for making sure that that information doesn't get out. Now, the other thing, and this should be a a no-brainer, but it should be part of the NDA, is that as the signer, you are obliged to not use any of that information to your own ends. I mentioned the membership list earlier. Well, if you have access to this huge mailing list, part of the NDA states that you can't use that mailing list for yourself. So that's one of the obligations is that you are not allowed to use any information that you learn. The same could be said if you are, let's say it's a company that's creating a new product and this is a publicly traded company, you might have to sign something and part of the NDA might state that you are not allowed to, I don't know, buy stocks in the company because you know that this new product that you're developing or that you're designing something for, maybe you're just designing the package for this new product that this company is going to be releasing. But you know that when they announce this new product, because nobody knows about it, it's a big secret, their stocks are going to soar. So mm, what a great chance. You go buy some stocks in this company because you know as soon as they announce this thing, the stock price is going to go up and you're going to make a killing. Well, part of the NDA might state that you cannot use any of the information given to you for your own ends. And that includes going out to buy stocks in the company or telling somebody else to buy stocks in the company because you know what's happening. That's all part of an NDA. And of course, one of the obligations is making sure that if you do have team members, that they are also made aware of what is allowed and not allowed to do. So if you're not working for your, just by yourself, if you have a team of designers or who knows, illustrators, copywriters, all these people have to be told that there is an NDA in place that you signed it, you are the head of the, the company and whatever, you might want them to sign an NDA as well. But by you signing it and covering your team, you are responsible to make sure they don't sell out or, or use the information themselves. So, and, and again, there's many, many scenarios and different obligations when it comes to an NDA. And I'm just naming a few of them. Now, things that can be excluded from an NDA This usually includes any sort of information that may be too broad or too burdensome for you to keep confidential. For example, this may be a crazy one, but say you were working or Apple hired you to work on the design or or something, maybe even the packaging or that for the next iPhone that is going to come out. Well, the iPhone 10 at this time, the iPhone 10 just came out a week or so ago. Well, let's say the iPhone 11, when it comes out, you're hired to design the stuff. Well, Everybody knows that there's going to be a new iPhone coming out. They even have an idea of what sort of time frame, what date. So maybe an NDA saying that you're not allowed to state that another iPhone will coming at, be coming out might be too broad. The NDA may include stuff like you're not allowed to talk about what the phone's going to look like or what features it's going to have because you might be including those on any of the, the design or the, the information that you're given. That is stuff to include in an NDA. But the fact that a new iPhone is coming out, that's too broad and too burdensome for you. I mean, you can't keep that a secret. It's almost general knowledge. Everybody knows the new iPhone will eventually come out. Now, the other thing to be excluded from an NDA is any information that you already knew or information that's publicly known. Like if two companies are merging or one company is buying another company and you are maybe rebranding the the new company because of the two mergers, Well, part of the NDA might say you're not allowed to divulge uh, the design, but saying you're not allowed to divulge the merger doesn't make sense if the merger is public knowledge. If everybody knows that company A has purchased company B, then there's no sense saying that you're not allowed to talk about that merger. 
Now, the other thing that should be excluded from an NDA, and this is just if by chance you are ordered by the court or some legal process to divulge information that you signed an NDA for, well, there should be a clause in the NDA stating that you are obliged to give that information. If the police come to you and they want to know information about your client and they have a court order, then you can give that information. You are not restricted under the NDA. Now, part of the NDA may stipulate that you have to tell your client that that information was requested of you, but you don't need your client's permission. All you need to do is tell your client that cops showed up at my door. They had a warrant for this information. So I handed it over to them. So the part about what's excluded from an NDA is a little bit more vague than the rest, but just keep in mind that there can be things in that section. Now, the last thing about what's included in NDA is the terms of agreement. Stuff like how long should an NDA last? Some clients might say, well, it might be forever, but that doesn't make sense. In the case of you designing a t-shirt for Taylor Swift, well, as soon as Taylor Swift announces her concert date or announces where, what venues, then your NDA is, should be over. At that point, you don't have to keep that secret. It's pub- now public knowledge. So in the terms of agreement, you should state how long it'll last. Like, is there going to be a, may, it might just say, two years from the date of signing or five years from the date of signing. And uh, from what I read, the little bit of research I did before doing this episode, a lot of NDAs fall in the two to five year terms if there's going to be just a a timeline. But it can be a certain date or an event. Like you can't talk about something until after. Like if you did design product for Apple's next iPhone, well, you can't talk about anything until the iPhone is released, at which point you can. Now, part of the terms of agreement and this is really important for designers and not just general people signing a tar- uh, uh, an NDA. But when it comes to designers, you need to know what you can and cannot use as part of your portfolio or just information you can divulge. Because sometimes they may ask you to sign an NDA saying that you can never use something in your portfolio. And you're saying, well, when would that be? Well, say you're hired by a creative agency to design something. Well, that agency might have you sign an NDA saying that you are not allowed to say that you worked for that client, not the agency, but the, cl- the agency's client. Let's just say for an example, Pepsi Cola hires a creative agency to do their next campaign. And that agency hires you to do a part of that campaign. Well, you might have to sign an NDA saying that you cannot divulge that you worked on that project or that you did work for Pepsi Cola. Because then it would undermine the agency. And what's to stop Pepsi Cola from saying, oh, we really love what this piece turned out like. Instead of going to the agency, why don't we go directly to that designer? So you can't divulge that information. That could be a clause in the NDA. And sometimes that might be you can never or you just can't divulge while the campaign is on. But once the campaign's over, then maybe you can. Now, there may be some sort of items in the terms of agreement saying that You cannot state the project you're working, but maybe you can state the client. So you can't say that you worked on Pepsi Cola's newest whatever, I don't know, they're coming out with a new flavor of cola. So you can't mention that you worked on that, but maybe you can mention that you worked with Pepsi Cola. Because, I mean, that's the sort of thing you might want to say and maybe not say, well, I worked on a specific thing. You can say, I have a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't say what I worked on. But one of my clients was Pepsi Cola. So there are different things that can be included in the terms of agreement. And as I said, there's many, many different items, different terms that can be included. Just keep in mind that there are all these different variants that you may have to look out for. So that's generally what is included in an NDA. The identification of the parties, a section determining what is confidential, Another section determining what your obligations are when you sign it. Something that says what is excluded from the NDA. And of course, the terms of the agreement. Now, keep in mind, as I said earlier, that an NDA is a contract. And as such, an NDA can be negotiated. So if a client comes to you and saying, here's an NDA we ask you to sign, look it over. And if there's something you don't agree with, like in my case, when I signed that NDA for that website, I could have easily asked them and said, listen, this says me, but I have somebody else that I use to do some work on my website. Can I include them in this NDA? Now, I didn't do this at the time, but I could have negotiated that and said, listen, 
you know, I want this other person included. Can we do that? And if they would have agreed, then I could have easily passed that work on to a third party and had them do that monotonous tax, which, you know, a couple of hours work there. Or in a case where maybe the client says, you can't divulge that you did this work. Well, go back and negotiate and say, okay, well, maybe I I can't divulge that I did this particular project, but can I divulge that I did work for this client? And sometimes they might agree to that. Like, really, would you be upset if Taylor Swift said you're not allowed to tell anybody that you designed her concert t-shirt, but she will allow you to say that you did work for her? I mean, I'd gladly add in my, uh, my website, my portfolio or whatever that I did work for Taylor Swift, but I'm not allowed to say what project I work on. Just the, the name dropping alone could help your business. So just remember that an NDA is a contract and can be negotiated. Now, because an NDA is a contract, there are consequences if you do break the terms, if you divulge anything, if whatever, if you break the contract, there can be consequences. And some of those consequences could be if you start, say, say an example, you get the mailing list, all the clients, and you send out an email to all these clients because you're looking for more work. You're trying to build your own business. And you say, hey, I've got this in list of a few thousand emails. Why don't I send out and see if anybody needs some design work? Well, if the client finds out, they can order a court injunction to stop you from doing this. And that can really hurt your business and especially your reputation. If word gets out that you did any of this stuff, it can really hurt your reputation. Not to mention that you will probably lose this job, this client, and word will get around. Now, that's just the the simple part of it. Breaking an NDA could lead to you being sued. If the client deems that the information you gave lost them money, like say, for example, that a client, maybe a, a jewelry store, is coming up with a Valentine's Day campaign and you are hired to design the brochures, the posters and all that for this Valentine's Day campaign that you're doing and you sign an NDA. Well, say you divulge to a competing jewelry company, maybe, I don't know, you, your brother-in-law or, or somebody you know owns another jewelry company and you say, oh, I'm working for this other one and I'm doing this Valentine's Day campaign for them. And wow, what a great deal. They're going to be selling whatever diamonds for whatever price. And then that person then puts out a special deal at the same time that undercuts your client. Well, if your client found out that that other jewelry store got the information through you, you could be sued for the amount of money they lost because of it. And that could put you out of business. So breaking an NDA could be very costly. Worst case scenarios, depending on what you share, like if it's financial information or client information, you could be prosecuted. So just keep that in mind that when you do sign an NDA, it is very serious if you do break it. It is a contract. Now, I've talked about you signing an NDA with your clients, but you can also use an NDA yourself. As I mentioned earlier, that sometimes an NDA that you sign covers your entire team. But maybe you don't feel good enough with that or the wording. So you might have an NDA that you have your team members sign. If you're working on a project and you hire an illustrator to do a certain part of that project, you might have that illustrator sign an NDA saying that they won't discuss this product until whatever time frame, until it's released or, or whatever. Or for the same reason that I mentioned earlier with when you sign an NDA with an agency because they don't want the client knowing who actually did the design work, You could do the same thing. You hire an illustrator to do something for you. Well, you have that illustrator sign an NDA because you don't want the client, which you think could come back for future work. You don't want the client finding out that that illustrator did it. So why should they go to you? They can just bypass you altogether and go directly to that illustrator. So you can have your team members, your contractors, if you're dealing with a printer and whatever it is that they are printing, say it's, who knows, maybe it's a political campaign. There is somebody that is going to announce their candidacy in some political race. And secretly, they have you design their brochures and their posters. But they haven't announced yet. They just want to be ready for the day they announce they're going to be able to hand out all this stuff. Well, you sign an NDA, but then you have to get all this stuff printed at the printer. Well, you might have the printer sign an NDA saying that they are not allowed to divulge any of this information until the candidate announces 
their campaign. Now, the other way that you can use an NDA, and this one is a little bit different, is say you're, you're down on your luck, you, you don't, uh, you, you work hasn't been coming in very well lately, and you really, really need the money. And you're contacted by a company that maybe if things were well, you might not work for them. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's um, an adult website. Let's put it that way. Maybe it's not something that you would normally work on, but you really need the money. And you say, well, maybe just this once I can build this website for this company. Well, you might get them to sign an NDA stating that they are not allowed to release your information or to say that you are the one to design that website because you don't want it to get out to your other clients that possibly you did or them start spreading the word. Oh, you know, you need a website and you're getting into the, you know, the adult photo site type thing. You know what I'm talking about. Well, you don't want your name passed around. So you have them sign an NDA. Now, as I said, this is a situation where you really, if you're really down on your luck and you need the money and you want to do the site, or maybe you have no problems working on that sort of site. And there's a lot of designers that I know of that have got their start and maybe still work in that industry because it's very lucrative, but they might want an NDA signed so that the information is not shared outside so that they, it doesn't get back to their other clients. Because could you imagine if one of your clients is maybe Big Brothers Big Sisters and you do stuff for them, you do posters, you do whatever for Big Brothers Big Sisters, and then they find out that on the side you're doing these other websites that could be, in the eyes of some people, morally wrong, it could really hurt your business. So in those cases, you could have an NDA that you have them sign. So that's basically what I wanted to talk about today is Just the fact that being a graphic designer or a web designer, at some point in your career, you may be asked to sign an NDA. It might not happen that often. I've been doing this for 27 years or so, and I have had several, but I'd say one in every hundred clients may have brought up the topic of an NDA. So just keep in mind and and know what's involved and what you can do. It is a contract. You can negotiate it. You can look at the terms and all the different parts of it and request changes. And if need be, you can use an NDA yourself with your team and contractors and printers and anyone else. They are there to protect your client and to protect yourself. So an NDA is a good thing. Now, if you're interested in seeing sample NDAs, I did find that there are some available at allbusiness.com slash forms hyphen agreements where they have all sorts of business forms. And I will include the link to this in the show notes. So if you can't remember allbusiness.com slash forms hyphen agreements, just look at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 95 and you'll see the link there. Now I'm curious, have you ever had to sign an NDA for a client you're working on or a project you were doing? I'd love to know about it. Of course, the parts you can talk about that is, but leave me a comment for this episode by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 95. And now this week's question of the week. This week's question comes in from Emma. And Emma says, Adobe has a lot of software available, including a lot of new ones like Dimensions, Spark, Muse, but which would you advise learning to boost your design capabilities above the usual Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign? Alternatively, Is there a software outside Adobe that you would recommend learning from? Well, thank you very much for the question, Emma. And I want to flip this around a little bit because first of all, no, I'm not going to give you any suggestions on software. What I will say is software is a tool. Just like a carpenter can use a one saw or a different saw or, you know, there's different screwdrivers they can use and still produce a beautiful cabinet, software is a tool for the designer. So what you need to do is not just learn the software. The best thing to do is learn the processes involved with creating whatever it is you're creating. Now, the other reason I can't really give you any idea is I don't really know, Emma, what you do as a designer. If you are doing package design, there's certain software you may use. If you are doing 3D rendering, there's software you can use. If you are more on the photographic side of stuff, there's software you can use. So depending on the niche or the specialty or just what sort of clients you have will determine what sort of software you're going to use. But the software is only a tool. What you need to do is learn the processes instead of software. Processes like, I don't know, if you do web work, then maybe you want to learn SEO. 
I don't offer SEO as a service in my business, but I learned SEO so that when I'm building websites, I can use SEO's best practices to make sure that the websites I build are as SEO friendly as possible. So when I say I don't offer it as a service, I won't go into a pre-existing website and better or increase the SEO, the search engine optimization. I won't do that as a service, but I learned the process so that when I am building a site for my clients, I create the best SEO site that I can. Another process I learned is, well, just basically WordPress, learning all the ins and outs of how WordPress works and not just the basics, but go into all the different sections of WordPress. It's a very intuitive and well-built program, but there's lots of little nooks and crannies in there that people sometimes never look at or they look at once and forget. So learn all these little things so that when the time comes, you know what to do and how to do them. Again, with websites, Google Analytics. Learn how to read Google Analytics so that if you need to improve stuff on a client's website, if the client is willing to pay you, then you can go in and analyze the analytics and find out what's working on their website, what's not working on their website, and where to improve. So unlike software, because and looking, if I click right now and I look at Adobe, other than Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign, which personally I don't use, I use Quark Express, I have used InDesign, there's one project that I, I have for a client now that I have to use InDesign for, but otherwise I use Quark Express. But looking through the Adobe list, XD, Premiere Pro, After Effects, Dimensions, Lightroom, Portfolio, Spark, Dreamweaver, Muse. Most of these, I can honestly say, I have no idea what they do. Hmm, character animation. Real-time 2D character animation with live output. Hmm, I didn't even know this was here. I might be curious, but really, I've got no use for 2D character animation. But at least now I know it's there. And if you remember my episode about just-in-time learning, well, there's a case. I don't need to know this stuff right now. But one day I might, so I'm now I, I know that it's available. I might go back and look at this in the future. But without knowing exactly what you're doing, I can't give you that answer other than learn the different processes. Take videos, courses, tutorials on places like YouTube, Udemy, Creative Live, Lynda.com, Skillshare. All these places offer great learning opportunities to learn design processes. And they will show you software in the process. But just keep in mind that software is a tool. Any tutorial that shows you how to do something in Photoshop, you can probably do the exact same thing using a software like Affinity Photo because the process is interchangeable and you can use it depending on the tools, which is the software that you have. So that's my answer to your question, Emma. Hopefully it's good enough. Now, if you would like your question answered on a future episode of the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and fill out the form and submit your question. Now, once again, this week's resource of the week was simply a mailbox. If you are running your own home-based business, I highly recommend you get yourself a PO box or a suite, a UPS store, and keep your home address private and away from your client's eyes. Now, if you've been enjoying Resourceful Designer, if you gain any knowledge, if you find any value in the podcast and the website, and you would like to give back and support the podcast, you can do so by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash Patreon, and that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, where for as little as $1 a month, you can support the show. And becoming a Patreon member also gives you access to some exclusive members-only content of Resourceful Designer. Now, I want to thank once again this week's sponsor, which is Storyblocks, a great source for images, photos, vectors, illustrations, videos, and audio clips. And right now you can get all three sites for the amazing deal of three for one. So you pay for one site and you get all three. And you can get that only by visiting storyblocks.com slash resourceful designer. Until next time, I am Mark Decote wishing you all the best with your graphic design business. And as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.